today um, we have the Yankee Bookshop and, Bookshop and <laughs> the library are co-hosting this um, gathering on reading banned books. Um, we want to thank WCTV, uh, Woodstock's Community Access Channel for filming. And if you have friends that couldn't be here today, it'll be up on their site and our site in a little while. Um, so today we're going to hear from Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, who actually organized and sponsored uh, a series of these events all around the state. Um, his guests are Joe Knowles, a local author who has written several acclaimed novels for middle school and um, young adult readers. And even if you're not in middle school or in high school, I encourage you to read them because they're really <laughs> incredible books. Um, and also Vermont Senator uh, Dick McCormick, who has served our Windsor County here for more than three decades. And the format's going to be pretty straightforward. The presenters will each read passages from books that have been banned. And then we'll open up the floor for discussion um, on free speech, inclusion, democracy, dialogue, whatever comes up around banned books. So welcome. Welcome, David. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Liza. I really appreciate it. And um, no, you're on here. You can ignore this. I'm going to ignore that. Um, uh, so thank you, and thank you so many folks for coming out. Uh, I have to say it's been uh, a real joy and pleasure doing these around the state, seeing how many folks are coming out, and in part uh, folks coming out because this has been a topic that's been in the news a lot lately. I think it's related to many, many different aspects of our society and culture, from critical thinking and democracy uh, to the role of government or not. Uh, to uh, many of the social and environmental issues and different topics that we're facing uh, in, in political and therefore everyone's lives. And when I thought about this topic in early, late winter, early spring, and was seeing what was going on in some other states around the country and in municipalities in really very diverse places around the country, I thought, well, maybe we should have this conversation before it becomes the, the hot item at a local school board or a municipal um, uh, meeting uh, so that we can really go a little deeper into the conversation than maybe what happens in brief news stories or certain news perspectives uh, that, that's been going on around the country. Um, as I open, I just want to point out uh, that the, the discussions I've been having that have actually been the most interesting to me and what I really want to happen is conversations with a wide range of viewpoints. Some of these have had uh, most of us thinking the same way uh, around books and whether they should be banned or fully accessible and, and so forth. And others have had folks with concerns about certain books being either available or perceived to be available to children uh, or books that they perceive to be being uh, censored. Uh, and I just ask that folks recognize that everyone is allowed to have whatever opinion they want to have. That is one of the joys and freedoms that we have. Um, and to hopefully foster a conversation that is removed from some of the uh, elevated energy that has happened a lot in today's politics and topics, um, but, but try to have a conversation around what are we really talking about here and what is banning, what is censorship, what is government role, community role, and, and not individualize it with personal attacks one way or the other. Um, so I just ask for that uh, sensibility, which almost seems odd to say here in Vermont, where we have, um, thankfully, town meeting and community conversations that often are diverse opinions and remain civil, which I think is one of the things that's really uh, is exceptional about Vermont. and, and I value that tremendously. Um, and part of the conversation may also be about civic participation and helping folks be prepared if uh, conversations come up in the community at the municipal level to then have more information at your fingertips for those conversations. So what we're going to do is have a few um, brief readings and, and commentary from our guests who I'll be introducing. I want to point out along with uh, Senator McCormick being up here. We've been joined by Senator Allison Clarkson, who I'm sure needs no introduction in this community, but thank you for coming. Uh, I have to do your thing first. 
Excuse me? Well, right. I know. And I saw it getting set up. I was like, I want to be over there. Um, uh, in any case, um, so thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm going to start uh, by introducing, as was earlier mentioned, uh, author Joel Knowles, who's going to give us a few words and thoughts about what you've written about and uh, maybe give us a little reading. So welcome. Uh, so yes, my name is Joe Knowles. I uh, live in Heartland for the past 20 years. And I've written, I've published 10 books, five of which have been banned um, in the past two, well, they've, they've been banned all along. But in the past two years, um, this growing uh, movement has meant that more and more of my books are being challenged and taken off um, of shelves, uh, mainly in Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, Ohio, um, and other places. Hopefully not Vermont yet, I haven't heard. <laughs> but um, so when I was asked to read, I had to choose between one of the five books that have been banned. And I um, decided to read from my most successful book. It was also a finalist in the Vermont, um, the, it used to be called the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Award. So I thought I would read from that book because it has a special place in my heart and I wrote it in memory of my brother who was gay and the main character in this book, her older brother, is also gay and that is why the book is banned. But it's not what the book is about at all. It's just part of the story and part of the makeup of this family. And so I thought I would try to find a passage that really gets to the heart of what the story is really about which is about a family who experiences tremendous loss um, and how it breaks the family apart, but how love is what brings them back together and helps them heal. And so in this scene, um, the main character is in, um, she's still getting over the loss of her younger brother, uh, who was three years old, and her best friend has come to see her for the first time since he found out what happened. And um, what else do you need to know? The older brother's name is Holden, and his new boyfriend is named Gray. So this is a new thing for me, uh, getting used to reading glasses. OK. I tried to call, Rand says, but no one answered. For the first time, I can't read his face. I've never seen this Rand before. Usually, his face matches his t-shirt motto, but today, his coat is zipped up just like his expression, and I don't know what to say. There was a story on the news last night, Bran says. I didn't want to believe it. When you didn't answer the phone, I went to the restaurant this morning and saw your dad, and he, he told me what happened. I just can't believe it. When he looks at me, I wonder what he must see, because suddenly, his blank expression changes, and he looks exactly like how I feel. And when I see him, tears start to slip down my cheeks again, stinging the raw skin there. And then he starts to cry too. Holden moves over on the couch so Rand can sit down. Then he pulls us both to him and we cry into his chest, our foreheads touching. I can feel Holden's heartbeat against my cheek and I close my eyes, concentrating on the sureness of it, grateful for it. But then the tears, but then the stairs creak and we sit up and quickly wipe our faces as my mom's feet appear at the top step. We wait quietly as she starts to come down, my sister following. I realize when I see her feet how much I really need her, how much I want her to hold me, to tell me I'm not sure what, maybe just to let me know she's here, that she always will be. But when she reaches the landing, she stops and turns. I just can't. She says, oh God, oh God. She starts to sob. Then her feet slowly climb back up the stairs and disappear. Holden takes a deep breath and stands up. I need to take a walk. You guys want to come? We nod. Outside, it's chilly but sunny. We stand at the end of the driveway and look around. Everyone feel, everything feels quieter. Holden kicks a stone across the road. I realize it's a school day and Ran has skipped. He shoots a stone across the road perfectly. The dog across the street comes bounding over and starts, yip starts yipping at us, hopefully, but he's trapped as usual. <clears throat> Holden's cell rings and he pulls it out of his pocket, turning his back to us. Hi, he says quietly. Yeah, really? Yeah. 
I'm here. I'm at the end of the driveway, actually. Okay, okay, thanks. He puts his phone back in his pocket. Gray's coming to get me, he says. The three of us continue to quietly kick stones up until Gray's car pulls up and Holden climbs in and they drive away. Rand looks cold and uncomfortable with his hands stuffed in his pockets. Come on, I say. He follows me to the neighbor's yard and what's left of the pine tree cave. This is a tree that they have a little fort under. We climb under and sit up against the tree, our arms pressed against each other. For a long time, we don't talk. I can feel our thoughts swirling together, our memories, our emptiness. When my mom was sick, I used to imagine what it would feel like if she died, he says after a while. I used to ask my dad what would happen to us, but he would just shake his head and not answer. He'd already lost his job because he kept staying home to take care of her. I kind of had to take care of myself, even though I didn't really know how. I picture Ran when I first knew him, with his two small clothes and always runny nose. Anyway, one weekend I went and stayed with my grandma, and she took me to our church. The minister told a story about this mystic who believed that even when there was all this horrible stuff going on, like the plague, that all would be well. She had this chant, and no matter how horrible things got, she would keep saying it. All will be well, she'd say. All will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. The minister had everyone in church say the chant, too. And I remember sitting there hearing everyone around me say those words, and I started to believe them. So after church, I started saying them to myself, muttering them every time I got scared about my mom. And pretty soon she got better. And I really believed it was because of my chanting. So I kept doing it, and life just kept getting better. My parents started the t-shirt company together, business boomed. I really thought if you said the words and believed them, they would be true. He stops for a minute and takes a sad, deep breath. I do the same and smell the piney Christmas smell and realize that Christmas will never be the same again. But the whole thing was a scam, Rand says. It was just one stupid thing to make me believe life isn't unfair. And just when I thought life was perfect, it became unbearable again. I think of all the times Rand has said those words to me, all will be well. He said them like they were a fact. I always secretly loved when he said them because I thought if anyone knew how things were going to turn out, it would be Rand. I was so wrong, he says quietly. I'm sorry, Fern. The ache in my throat throbs harder, but I don't cry again. I breathe in the cold air and concentrate on the branches in front of me, the hundreds of needles poking out of each thin stick. I think of all the times Holden and I hid under here, listening to Charlie call out for us, Holy Fernie, where are you? How we giggled and shushed each other so he wouldn't find us. Why didn't we want him to find us? My mom said, that I was the kind of person who had saved anyone in trouble. But she was wrong. I wouldn't save anyone. I didn't even try. I wish I kn he knew how much I love him, I say quietly. But I was always telling him to leave me alone. What if he thinks I didn't love him? He knew, knows, Rand says. He reaches for my hand and holds it gently. He knows. When the sun moves and leaves us in the shade, we both start to shiver. I should probably go, Rand says. We climb out of the cave and walk back to my yard. The house seems quiet. We both look up at the front door but stay standing outside. Charlie's tricycle is tipped over next to the garage. I think we notice it at the same time because we both turn away. Usually, when Rand goes home, he leaves me with some sort of slogan that matches whatever t-shirt he's wearing. Today. He just looks at me with sad eyes I've never seen before. Help me, I say, with my own eyes, but his say back, I can't. Thank you. <laughs> you never know how things are gonna touch you as you listen. Uh, my father passed away when I was 13, and I remember uh, I've, I've always wondered, I guess, but uh, I used to every day when I'd leave the hospital I'd say, you know, Good goodbye, Dad, I'll see you tomorrow. And I've always wondered, did I say that that last day? And is that what had been keeping him alive? So as you um, mentioned those words, it brought that back. So thank you. Um, 
Our next uh, reader uh, is Senator Dick McCormick, who also needs no introduction in this community. Um, and uh, he's reading a book that is a true story, children's book. So, welcome. Well, the topic is um, censorship. I had thought um, of reading a scene from Macbeth where the early part of the play builds, the tension builds as to is Macbeth going to murder Duncan or not. And there's a scene that ends with him saying, if for done, when for done, better to done quickly. And he unsheathes his sword and walks off stage. At that point, two drunk guards come in and discuss the effects of alcohol on male uh, virility. It doth increase the desire but decrease the ability. And that scene was censored when I was in high school. And of course, it was a very good example of Shakespeare's pacing. He's built the tension and now suddenly there's a comedy scene just before the scream that announces that Duncan has been murdered. He throws the audience completely off. It's like Beethoven putting in a little couple of quiet measures before the explosion of the... Anyway, this is a children's uh, book. It's a beautiful little book. The title is And Tango Makes Three. Lovely illustrations. The room is a little large for you to see them if I hold them up. Um, and uh, the early part, it describes the zoo at Central Park and the penguin facility and life among the penguins. And I'll pick it up here. Every year at the very same time, the girl penguins start to notice the boy penguins. And the boy penguins start noticing the girls. When the right girl and the right boy find each other, they become a couple. Two penguins in the penguin house were a little bit different. One was named Roy and the other was named Silo. Roy and Silo were both boys, but they did everything together. They bowed to each other, they sang to each other, and they swam together. Wherever Roy went, Silo went too. They didn't spend much time with the girl penguins, and the girl penguins didn't spend much time with them. Instead, Roy and Silo wound their necks around each other. Their keeper, uh, Mr. Grammy, noticed the two penguins and thought to himself, they must be in love. Roy and Silo watched how the other penguins made a home, so they built a nest of stones for themselves. Every night, Roy and Silo slept there together, just like the other penguin couples. And every morning, Roy and Silo woke up together. But one day, Roy and Silo saw that the other couples could do something they could not. The mama penguin would lay an egg. She and the papa penguin would take turns keeping the egg warm until finally it would hatch and then there would be baby penguins. Roy and Silo had no egg to sit on and keep warm. They had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. Their nest was nice but it was a little empty. One day, Roy found something that looked like what the other penguins were hatching, and he brought it to their nest. It was only a rock, but Silo carefully sat on it and sat and sat. When Silo got sleepy, he slept, and when Silo was done sleeping and sitting, he swam, and Roy sat. Day after day, Silo and Roy sat on the rock, but <clears throat> nothing happened. Then Mr. Gramsci got an idea. He found an egg that needed to be cared for, and he brought it to Roy and Silo's nest. Roy and Silo knew just what to do. They moved the egg to the center of their nest. Every day they turned it so each side stayed warm. Some days Roy sat while Silo went for food. 
Other days, it was Silo's turn to take care of the egg. They sat in the morning and they sat at night. They sat through lunchtime and swam, swim time and supper. They sat at the beginning of the month and they sat at the end of the month and they sat all of the days in between. Until one day, they heard a sound coming from inside the egg. Peep, 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 it said. Roy and Silo called back. Squawk, squawk, peep, peep, answered the egg. Suddenly, a tiny hole appeared in the egg's shell. And then, crack, out came their very own baby. She had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black beak. Now Roy and Silo were fathers. We'll call her Tango, Mr. Ramsey decided, because it takes two to make a tango. <laughs> Roy and Silo taught Tango how to sing for them when she was hungry. They fed her food from their beaks. They snuggled her in their nest at night. Tango was the very first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. Soon, Tango grew strong enough to leave the nest. Roy and Silo took her for a swim just like all the other penguin families. And all the children who came to see to the zoo could see Tango and her two fathers playing in the penguin house with the other penguins. Hooray, Roy. Hooray, Silo. Welcome, Tango, they cheered. At night, the three penguins returned to their nest. There they snuggled together and like all the other penguins in the penguin house and all the other animals at the zoo and all the families in the big city around them, they went to sleep. Uh, before I read, I wanna mention, uh, I put up a, a board over there uh, with I believe it's about 12 or 1400 books that have been uh, challenged or banned in the last year. And the numbers of these la in these last couple of years have doubled and tripled from the sort of annual average prior to. So one of the reasons you're hearing about it more in the news is because it's happening more. Uh, why it's happening is maybe a piece of what we'll discuss uh, in a little bit. My glasses are so I can see you. I can actually read up close. So. I'm too getting used to them. Uh, the, the plurality of topic that are banned are two main categories. Uh, gender, uh, which has been brought up in uh, and, and love of same gender or non-binary uh, situations is right up there. I think it's 35 to 40% of the books that are banned. Uh, another 35 to 40% are around racial issues, whether it's history, or books discussing uh, race in contemporary uh, scenarios as well. Uh, a number of others are around coming of age. And um, of course, at some point, I think just about everyone here, if not everybody, went through puberty and uh, the, the conversation of, of learning about that, which happens in some houses and not all homes. So uh, those books are also uh, out there. Uh, and librarians or in a library, so thank you again for hosting, uh, in schools and public libraries are often where folks get their information. Um, so those are the, some of the main categories of books that are banned. Uh, I often bring a couple different books depending on what's been read. Um, so I'm gonna go with uh, Beloved by Toni Morrison, uh, a book that many folks have read. It was an uh, English book in my high school. Uh, I'll also add that my U.S. history textbook was Howard Zinn, A People's History. So if you're ever curious about my politics, you can blame my, my parents and my history teacher, I suppose. Um, but again, uh, a book uh, depicting, uh, you know, based on a lot of truth, um, impacts of slavery uh, and the very difficult circumstances of our, of our past. Um, that has often led to some of the 
traumas and challenges we still face today. So this book, uh, the, the passage I'm going to read is about uh, Baby Suggs, who is the uh, grandmother or maybe mother of the, of the main character. Um, and it's on a plantation and it's set in a space away from the main housing area where uh, the slaves went maybe in the evening to have a little sanctuary. After situating herself on a huge flat-sided rock, Baby Suggs bowed her head and prayed silently. The company watched her from the trees. They knew she was ready when she put her stick down. Then she shouted, let the children come. And they ran from the trees towards her. Let your mothers hear you laugh, she told them. And the woods rang. The adults looked on and could not help smiling. Then let the grown men come, she shouted. They stepped out one by one from among the ringing trees. Let your wives and your children see you dance, she told them, and ground life shuddered under their feet. Finally, she called the women to her. Cry, she told them, for the living and the dead. Just cry. And without covering their eyes, the women let loose. It started that way, laughing children, dancing men, crying women, and then it got mixed up. Women stopped crying and danced, men sat down and cried, children danced, women laughed, children cried, until exhausted and riven, all and each lay about the clearing, damp and gasping for breath. In the silence that followed, baby Suggs, holy, offered up to them her great big heart. She did not tell them to clean up their lives or go and sin no more. She did not tell them they were bl the blessed of the earth, its inheriting meek or its glory-bound pure. She told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine, that if they could not see it, they would not have it. Here, she said, in this place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass, love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh, they despise it. They don't love your eyes, they just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together, stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leavens instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here, flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and to dance, backs that need support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck, put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts, that they just as soon slop for hogs, you've got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it. Love it. And the beat and beating heart, love that too. More than eyes or feet. More than lungs that have yet to draw free air. More than your life-holding womb and your life-giving private parts. Hear me now, love your heart. For this is the prize. Saying no more, she stood up then and danced with her twisted hip, the rest of what her heart had to say, while the others opened their mouths and gave her the music. Long notes held until the four-part harmony was perfect enough for their deeply loved flesh. So, Part of it is the readings and just to un, you know, hear some of the, the words that have been banned, are banned, uh, similar genres being banned uh, all, all across the country, primarily 
Texas and Florida, but Pennsylvania and in communities in states across the country. Um, and a few folks have asked me, you know, why am I doing this? In Vermont, we've, we haven't had any banned books yet. We have had some challenges. We've also had some school boards and curriculums challenged, as you know, just up the road in Heartland and in other communities. In Essex, uh, Vermont, up in Chittenden County, folks were running for the school board. Uh, they lost, but they've run uh, with a sort of curriculum uh, agenda uh, in their campaigns. Springfield. 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 That's right. Um, and, uh, and, and that there are also, uh, as we have an author here, there are authors in Vermont who have had books banned. So it's also economically impacting many Vermonters. We are a very literary uh, and author-rich state, uh, the arts in general. Uh, we know other arts have often been challenged, theater, uh, paintings, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, love to hear either questions that we may be able to answer or other folks may be able to answer uh, and or thoughts and conversation about the topic of banning books uh, and censoring books and so forth. So anybody's got a thought, please feel free to raise your hand. Because I can go on and on. I am a politician after all. I'll make an observation. This country has, was founded on cognitive, cognitive dissonance and it's always linked with cognitive dissonance and we don't necessarily recognize it. So we don't necessarily recognize it and we say we're the freest people on earth with free speech and yet we can't recognize that gay people exist or that, you know, we don't have a, you know, you know, black people are, have been, were enslaved. We just we somehow think that it's an insult um, to say that when in fact it's just a simple recognition. And so, um, until we address that cognitive dissonance, I don't really see how we're going to solve any of these issues. Well, I, I think part of this conversation is about that and reminding folks that the broader information that we have the uh, more capable we are of understanding our communities, the benefits and disadvantages, um, and then people can do with that what they wish, right? Everyone is allowed to come to their own conclusions, hopefully with accurate information. Um, but I think that's a really good point. <coughs> well, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. No, it's just that I think it's getting harder. I mean, we have a political party that's really running on it got no economic message it got no other type of message it's just sort of like those people are ruining our country and we have to stop them we do have a political party running on that um yeah just going back to what you said just a little bit earlier i I think especially in the children's book world where so many, so a majority of these books are being taken out of schools and school libraries and things. And um, one of the things that I keep sort of going back to is knowledge is power. <laughs> and when we share books about tough topics, um, we are empowering children. We are giving them the tools to navigate all the difficult things that they are going to face in life. Um, and that's empowering, even though some will say, that's difficult, that makes them sad, that makes them scared. I don't want them to know about childhood sexual abuse. I don't want them to know about, um, you know, whatever it is, right? But in a book, what a safer place to deliver information like that than in a book that they can ask you questions, that they can ask their teacher or their parent or whoever questions. But you know, an example of this where I see this desire to take away power from children is especially the books that deal with childhood sexual abuse. So my first book, it's called Lessons from a Dead Girl. It has been on the American Library Association's most banned book list for years. It, it came out in 2007. And it deals with childhood sexual abuse. And it's not, it's banned though because it says it has inappropriate content. Um, it never, whenever these books are challenged, there's never really an explicit reason, um, but that's obviously what it is. And in the story, you know, it's a story ultimately of hope. The main character, she figures out 
what's happening to her and her friend, and they she she gets help. Um, and when it was first banned, uh, it, the the big one that got lots of publicity was in Kentucky, and the superintendent or the I'm sorry the vice principal of the school was sort of the one leading leading the charge of getting rid of any books that had anything to do with um, sexual survival, sexual abuse survival. Well, 10 years later, mm. that person no. was arrested on like 14 counts of childhood pornography. So when people talk about wanting to protect children, sometimes I think we need to really ask, from what? Um, because he was trying to keep knowledge from children. He, wants, he wanted to keep children in the dark because he did not want children to know how to get help. He didn't want children to realize that these kinds of things happened to anybody else. And that's the main thing that kids tell me when they read my books. Almost always it's, I didn't know this happened to anyone but me. Mm -hmm. That's what they always say. And that's what I mean when I say knowledge is power because it empowers them to feel like they're not alone and they can seek help. They see what the main character does in a book. They see how they survive. They, they suddenly have a tool that they didn't have before. And so we can pretend that we think our child is too young to read about such a topic, but they are never too young because ch all children are at risk of these things. Um, and what better way to protect them than to talk about it? That's what prevents these things, not keeping them in the dark. So. I certainly agree with what you've said. Uh, I guess the question I have is, can you offer us any advice as to how we can fight against this banning of books? Uh, you know, what can we do? I, mean, I, I kind of cringe a little bit when you say knowledge is power, because one of my greatest concerns is, what is knowledge? You know, what is real? What is fact? How do we get our, our, our citizens and our children to learn, you know, how to really discern what the facts are, what, what, what is real and what is not real, with all this, uh, uh, you know, social networking and uh, the internet and everything else. There's a lot of information out there, and a lot of it is false. How, how, how can we make sure that we're getting through message? Well, I think it's, you're absolutely right. It's a very difficult topic. One of the, well, I, there's a few things. One is the American Library Association um, actually has legal staff to help local libraries fight these challenges. Uh, but the American Library Association is actually losing members because now some of these groups are going after the libraries to get them to disassociate from the American Library Association. Um, so there is a real campaign out there. I don't know whether the ALA takes donations, but that would be one thing. Uh, another piece is these conversations, uh, I think, are important, at least for the Vermont scenario, if this comes up. Because, for instance, one thing I think to point out to some of the folks who maybe say, I don't want my kid to see this. Well, there's a couple different responses to that that I can offer. One is, unlike Banning's 50 years ago, or 60 years ago now, which I think probably don't have to say the name, McCarthyism and so forth, uh, was you know the precursor to moving towards authoritarianism, which of course is part of what we're looking at right now with our democracy. But 50 years ago, we didn't have a different source of information. And so one of the things I say to folks who say, I don't want my kid to see this, or the librarian or the teacher to offer this book, typically more about uh, either same gender relationships or abuse and so forth, is they're going to find it. And the question is, do you want it to be guided by a knowledgeable librarian who's going to give them the, the book that is probably, quote, and it's a very dangerous term, but age appropriate, but the the, the book that is fitting for where they're at with the questions they're asking? Or do you want them just to type a few words in and who knows what they're going to find and what they're going to learn through the internet? And that does give some folks some pause because the idea that the kids are not going to access information is foolish. 
And so the question is, do you want it to be well guided? Now that's one type of information. There's a much broader set of information that's also challenging, which is being, as you pointed out, sort of exploited with the, you know, they're our problem, they're our fault, these people, those people, whether it's immigration or urban, AKA alias for black. Um, and I think that, and I'm gonna go back to my Howard Zinn roots, is a lot more about economics. People who are pointing fingers at others, they're being easily guided to do that because they're struggling in a system that if they work hard, they're supposed to succeed and get ahead. That's the, that's the story we've been told under sort of pure capitalist thinking for decades, right? And capitalism has its successful and good things. It also has its faults. And we are seeing more and more people being left behind and they're working hard. And you either look in the mirror and go, I'm working really hard and I'm not getting ahead. I thought if I worked really hard, I was supposed to. Well, you're either going to look in the mirror and say, well, I guess it's my fault, which very few of us can or will do, or you're going to point the finger at somebody else. So to me, I think from information as well as really the long-term, one of the long-term ways to start to get out from under this is to really look at where the economic struggles are and how is our society failing many of these populations. Um, and I could tell a story from being a kid in rural Virginia that voted 85% for Trump, three major businesses in a 13,000 person county, and they've all pretty well closed or gone away and they were come out of high school and make a middle class living and those jobs are gone they're overseas those folks are struggling they voted 85 percent for trump i mean it's not hard to draw the line uh that connects the dots i, I don't know if others have solutions but partly it's it's having these kinds of conversations um i had one family at a, one of these discussions it was a grandmother with her grandson who was about 10. And he said, you know, in my religion, we're taught that pride is a sin. And in school, they're shoving pride down my throat. And I paused and I said, well, words can have multiple definitions. And how would that 10-year-old ever hear that or learn that unless they were talking to a librarian or a teacher if their parent isn't going to tell them that? And I said, you know, pride as far as the sin of being boastful and I'm the best and I'm number one and pasha to you all. Fair enough, not a very good characteristic to have. But pride in whoever you are, being who you are and being happy about who you are is a different definition of that word. And that's the definition, I said, that, that's being talked about today, that people have been told they're lesser or they're wrong or they're outcasts. We're saying, be who you are and thrive in who you are and, and, and thrive in life. And he's 10 years old. I don't know if he's going to go home and immediately go, oh, I get it. But I often use farming analogies. I just like to plant a seed sometimes. And maybe that seed will grow. Maybe it won't. But having those conversations is critical and not demeaning someone who has a different perspective because we're very good at that these days. Dave, that yeah, please. I think also, I mean, Thanksgiving is just two months off, you know, so it's crazy uncle time. Uh, <laughs> we, we all have conversation with our fellow citizens all the time. Uh, we've got a couple of, of politicians here who I think will agree that usually a debate is won or lost by how the question is worded, how the question is framed. And I think, for example, there is a movement now which is saying people who do not conform to binary sexual identity and sexual attraction, uh, people who, are, who deviate from now, these guys in the tango book, um, are real. They're here. They're our neighbors. They're our friends. They're our relatives. And uh, it's their world, too. And they're entitled to um, respect and to equal rights. If you frame the question that way, you say, do you agree with that or disagree with that? I think very few people would say they disagree. So we give it a new name, the woke agenda. And now the question is no longer, do we behave decently towards our, our gay and lesbian friends? 
Because the, que- the answer to that question, I mean, yeah, we probably should. There are some people who are hateful and will say no, but then engage that argument. They'll, they'll lose that argument. Should we let the liberal elitists impose the woke agenda on us and suddenly a bigot like uh, Santos there, uh, DeSantis, what's the name of the governor of Florida? Yeah. DeSantis. DeSantis. Okay. DeSantis. A, a bigot like that poses as some kind of champion of freedom. And millions of people, although not that many, but millions of people uh, buy into it. And I can remember way back uh, years ago when we were doing the civil unions debate. The slogan was not, let's keep being mean to the gays, or something like that. The slogan was, take back Vermont. Should we let the gay agenda impose itself on the people of Vermont? And if you, if you think about it, that is always what's done. The argument was raised about slavery as early as Abigail Adams talking about slavery. And the response was not to talk a whole lot. Well, there's some people who did. They, they really defended slavery aggressively. But for the most part, the debate was between abolitionism and saving the Union, preserving the Union. If we try to abolish slavery, it'll break up the Union. And, and uh, states' rights, rather than civil rights, civil rights versus Jim Crow, God forbid people should have the real debate. States, you know, Jim, civil rights versus Jim Crow, it became civil rights versus states' rights. Our right to govern ourselves down here in Alabama, and they're taking away our rights. So I think one of the things, and this, one of the reasons I mentioned Thanksgiving, is that this is something we each do in our individual um, discussions. And um, I find when, when I operate, when I remind myself that I don't want to get sucked into the debate about the woke agenda. I want to stick to the issues. And um, it's hard to do because they'll keep trying to pull you into the, the, the phrasing that I'm imposing my agenda on. I get told, you know, go, why don't you go back to New York with your runny brie and chablis? And my answer is, well, of course I want my brie runny. It's... If it's not runny, it's overpriced cream cheese, for God's sake. But, <laughs> but, uh, so I'm, I'm guilty of good taste. Anyway, I guess, I guess I've said my little piece on this. Please, in the back. Yes, so why do you think people who are so opposed to teaching black history are afraid of? What are they so afraid of? I have a thought, but I don't want to make sure you get a chance. I just rambled, but I am an, uh, a retired history teacher, so I'll, I'll answer that. The, uh, I, am, I am a lib- liberal progressive politician, but I want black history taught because I'm a history teacher. And the first obligation of the teaching of history is simply tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And not only was there slavery in our early days, the country was founded on slavery, not just in the South. New England shipping included the shipping of slaves. Okay, New England mills used cotton from the South. So this is, uh, and there are people who don't want that because it makes us look bad. Well, it does. Tell the truth. The truth will set you free. I'm going to. You said a great piece uh, either yesterday or the day before. Um, one of the op eds that, that people didn't want children to be made to feel bad. Yeah. That, they, that they somehow, that, that the books that were being banned or the history that was, a, maybe it was a curriculum discussion, I can't remember, but it was, uh, it was all centered around making, you know, the white kids didn't want to make them feel bad about history. They didn't want some. Kids, right? Exactly. To feel that. Exactly. They weren't worried about other kids. Not exactly. Kids. So they aren't worried about how black kids have felt or said, you know, for ages about how history has been taught and what it, and indigenous uh, children feel how they have felt uh, about the way history was taught. Mm-hmm. But they're worried about the white kids in Texas and how hurt their feelings are going to be if they made you feel bad about what their ancestors And they don't challenge, they don't bring up, oh, well, and we shouldn't talk about. The textile mills, whether it's the woolen mill in you know Winooski or 
Lowell and, and Lawrence, Massachusetts, where you know kids worked in mills and lost fingers and fell through holes, and then we should get rid of that too, right? That's bad history. But they, they focus on race because it's an easy divider. And I'll go back to the rural poor county in Virginia that I'm familiar with, where 10 years ago, they could have voted to have one high school, but they actually voted to keep two high schools because the Luray High School was primarily black and the county high school was primarily white. And even though it was gonna save them money to create one high school, they voted to keep two. I mean, there is still racism. And if you're gonna talk about our history, you're gonna also be thinking about the present. And none of us are responsible for the things we didn't do, but we are responsible for the choices we make when we have the information and knowledge of what's going on today. And they don't want us to be having those conversations. So they focus on the things that we, you know, that divide us. Um, but that's, that's why I think it's back to that. I'm not doing well because of those people, whether it's immigrants from any range of South America coming across the border or the people in this country who have been less than for the, the whole history of our country. Yes, please. Uh, I spent a career uh, defending parts of a book uh, that many people feel uh, is sacred as an ordained minister. Mm -hmm. uh, when if you take certain passages out of that book and only look at them in isolation from everything else that's in that book, they would be labeled as whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it part of when you held up the iPhone, do you want your kids to learn about uh, bullying by uh, seeing something on the internet that is simply there for purian interest? Or do you want to learn about bullying by reading a book like Kite that has a graphic description of bullying uh, that is sexual of a young boy. Now, the context is everything. And there's hardly a book alive that I couldn't find something that, that I would uh, personally <laughs> wish you'd never seen. <laughs> But I want to take a look at the whole thing, and some of our uh, court decisions uh, in the last 50 years have really come down hard on the context. This can be a, a literary masterpiece, even though it has a few paragraphs that might qualify it to make that list. Just my two cents. Well, and back to your point earlier as well, another argument or topic to bring up with folks, and this happened in uh, Manchester, and Mia Schultz, who's head of the NAACP of Rutland County, she lives in Bennington, but it blends the two counties. The topic was coming up of banning books, and she said, who chooses? Who chooses which books are banned or going to be banned? And some folks can hear that and suddenly go, oh, what if my book? But you can even give an example to someone who's saying, well, this should be banned. Think about who they are. You may stereotype them one way or another. I'm about to, it could be right, it could be wrong. So it's, but we talk about lots of different people in groupings. Um, say, well, what if a group of people said there should be no books that have guns or gun violence because that can be really traumatizing to kids. And exposure to guns is, is a bad idea. And if the majority of the community thinks that's a bad idea, then why don't we just ban all books that talk about guns? Or, and, and think of other examples that might be something that feels very natural and normal to the individual you're speaking with uh, and say, would you want 
your normalized topic to be banned? And who decides? And in a, in a free and open society, and that's why when people say to me, um, well, what about this book? Or what about that book? Or isn't there a line? That's when I say that there is no line. Because who draws the line? And it's also partly really important to talk about libraries and school libraries and school librarians to point out that, you know, they're really thoughtful people who know more about these books than most people in every room they walk into, uh, including asking people who say, what about banning this book? Have you read it? A lot of times they haven't even read the book because they've heard about it on a radio or a TV station over and over. And so they're like, this book must be bad. Clearly, there are passages in the Bible that would qualify for banning. And I believe in a couple places the Bible's been challenged, I think, as a bit of a retort, not as a, as a true effort, but for that reason. So those are another way to sort of have the conversation about, really? Yeah. One way I see, and I try to practice, about, I have an 11 year old grandson, and we have conversations when we're together as a family, his family and our family. We had a conversation about World War II and World War I, and he kept asking questions, and then we could answer them. That's why we need to not ban them, because if you don't know what it is, you know, you're, how can you say it should be banned? But if we have conversations with our kids and our neighbors, whether they're kids or younger, oh, you have to have conversations with people and not arguments, but share the facts. And we don't do as much of that, I, my prejudice is, we don't do as much of that as it has been in the past in many places. And it's hard to do it, as you brought up earlier, there's so much information out there, much of it non-factual. I went to my mechanic the other day, uh, and I don't remember how politics came up other than the fact that they poke me pretty much every time I walk in. Um, and uh, I didn't know this one person's politics, the bookkeeper, and she said, go Trump. And I said, fair enough, you have a right to your opinion. I said, but I'm curious why. And she said, well, he, he's got a bad mouth, but he, he did a lot of good and so forth. And, and why aren't they going after Biden and Hunter Biden? I said, well, you know, I've been learning about that. The other day there was a story on public radio, I'm assuming there's a few people that listen, that went through the history of the prosecutor who is actually a Trump appointee that Merrick Garland left in place in order not to be political and change him. And that the person is a sl known as a slow and methodical prosecutor. And so the next time I walked in, I just brought that up. I said, you know, I don't know if you're aware from where you get your information, but the, the prosecutor or the investigator, uh, state's attorney, is actually a Trump appointee. And they kept him in place. And I just left it at that. I didn't try to hammer the point home and tell her she was wrong. And she, her head sort of, you know, and I just left it, right? Because sometimes you can try to push too hard. And I think in this scenario, a lot of these folks are so deep down the rabbit hole that just offering a slice of the pie, not the whole pie, and letting that simmer for a few days um, is one way, and it's really person by person. You know, I, we don't have the mass media capabilities, but none of these are the solution. The point is to have various tools. Uh, the woman in the back, yeah. Um, I wonder if any of you could offer me advice, or also if there are any educators or librarians here. Um, I'm an editor at a very large children's publishing company in the Classroom Magazines division, and my colleagues and I are in the very uncomfortable position of having to share the news with students in grades K to 12 in the honest, factual way, while also not ever putting a teacher in a position of getting fired for using one of our resources. And I wonder if you have any advice about how to think about that or approach it. I'll look to my librarian first, but I can try and stab at it if you want. The, the question um, as a, as a uh, 
editor at a children's and young adult uh, publishing house, trying to figure out what, and this is a part of the sort of shadow censorship, by the way, that's also part of what's going on. We haven't even talked about that, of uh, both what goes into some of those books or what might get edited out, and also um, how to try to make sure a book isn't going to get a teacher in trouble if they, based on what the editors suggest to the authors to change or not. And my response to that is that it's really not the publisher's job to keep have the teacher's school system be supporting the school system. That's their community's job. And I think that, um, this is my personal opinion, because I actually come from a book selling background much longer than my library background. Mm -hmm. But I think as an editor, your job is age appropriate language and um, issues, but it's really not uh, edit and, and, and good language and good writing, but it's not editing for social content um, because that's the community and the teacher and the school system. That's my take. Thank you. Yeah, Can I add to that? I, yeah, I, I feel it's like disheartening to think you're even thinking in those ways um, because you should be publishing what you believe in. So if your company has for example, a mission statement or a policy about what you publish and why, that should be obviously made very clear to the buyer at the, whoever is in charge, if it's the school librarian or their teacher who's buying your materials, to know there, it's their responsibility to read the content and make the decision. It's not yours. Yours is to provide quality, um, factual information. And wow, that's like a really dangerous area to start to go if, if publishers are starting to be too afraid um, to be publishing what they believe in. Um, but I know, I mean, I'm sorry to say, I know that's, that is happening. But um, yeah, that's, it's, the, it's the librarian's responsibility and the teacher's responsibility to make those purchasing choices. And of course, capitalism. Um, if the publisher thinks, well, if I publish these things, no one's going to buy it because they're all too afraid, but then, but that's where we are, you know, that's where we are right now. Publishers are, um, and I'm not to single you out, uh, I'm lucky enough that I've had a publisher that is willing to take risks and, and publish books that might be, quote, controversial, um, but if, if we are now getting to the point where we are going to um, whitewash history because, and I, I really don't believe that parents are afraid of that their children are going to feel guilty if they read about history. I think that is a cop, I think that is a lie. I think that is an easy excuse that a very smart group of people who have created this campaign to change the way history is taught in schools has thought, I know what we'll do. We'll make it look like these are parents who are concerned about their children, when really, I, I'm a cynic. I think it's there is much more going on there in terms of a campaign to stop empowering people to see what once was. If we hide history, we repeat history. And that's really what's going on. Um, there are peop white people in power who want white people to remain in power. And when we teach diversity and when we teach history and all of those things and we have affirmative action and we try to make, we try to um, influence equity and inclusion and all of those things that are woke and wonderful, um, <laughs> then a certain group of people feel that they are going to become disempowered. They don't want to share. <laughs> um, and so, I don't know. I, I probably should stop talking. <laughs> but um, that's, I, I, just, I just don't believe that, that we have been teaching history. We have been teaching history about enslaved people for decades. And suddenly, children feel bad. No, that is not. I'm sorry. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, I, it's not I just want to stick something. Sure, go ahead. I had mentioned earlier how you frame the question. Mm -hmm. OK. Should we make children feel bad and feel guilty and feel bad about themselves because they're white? That's not the question. The question is, should they know the truth? And I think we also need to make a distinction between guilt and shame on the one hand and responsibility on the other hand. 
It's a, we are citizens of a republic, and our children are going to be citizens of a republic. That means we are responsible. We may not be guilty. I understand, I've heard the argument all the time. I wasn't even born when they had slavery. It's not my fault. Okay, agreed. Now that that's settled, we're <laughs> citizens of a republic, which has a heritage derived largely or in part from slavery. We also have a very noble ideology to the contrary, and they're in conflict. Which way are we going to go? And we're responsible for answering that. But again, frame the question in such a way that you can't lose, and you win the argument. Uh, there's a person in the back who wants to speak. I just want to acknowledge that we are past 5 o'clock. So no one will be, I think, uh, uh, disturbed if you've got to leave. Um, I can certainly stay. I don't know if you two can stay for a little bit longer during questions. But I also want to just pass this around, which I meant to do earlier. Uh, as lieutenant governor, I do send out an occasional newsletter about once a week during the session, uh, less frequently in the off session, about topics going on in Montpelier or if this comes up in a community across the state, I will probably make sure folks are aware in the same way that the media might, um, but sometimes mine can go a little more depth because I'm not limited by the media truncation. Uh, so if you're interested, feel free to sign on. If you're not interested, just pass it along. Uh, pre preferably email, because that saves us all a lot of money in paper and trees. But if you don't have email, you can put your address and get a paper copy. Uh, the woman in back had a, a thought she wanted to ask. Uh, I love to do what you speak about publishing companies, and it has been mentioned that textbook companies, I think there's big money behind changing the textbooks, and that to me is very concerning, um, and I'm very political, and I'm not sure what to do about it, what we can do about it, but the textbooks are major in teaching the history, the black history, you know. So I just wanted to mention that. Gentlemen here, and then I'll come to you. Yeah, full disclosure, I don't want to sound like a plug school board member here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Let's. For the first speakers about what we can do, and this is kind of what we've been ruminating on the whole time, it's support public education. Right? This goes back to Thomas Jefferson. It's essential to our democracy. And in our school district, you know, we took our pandemic dollars and we've got an initiative to put structured learning in place to move our literacy rate from 68% to, not literacy, but uh, reading uh, proficiency. proficiency, thank you, from 68%, which is pretty great for Vermont, to 90%. And that's essential that we teach our kids to read and we teach our kids to think critically. To get back to the woman in the back who was asking about, you know, why are people afraid of, um, you know, teaching black history? The, the, the real opposition to critical race theory is critical thinking, right? It's, it's thinking about um, these things and, and to address the, the person who was concerned about textbooks, kids in Florida can pick up their smartphones and log on to the New York Public Library and read all the banned books that they can't get in their, their own libraries. I see these things as an asset for us versus you know, something to be afraid of. Some know that, some don't. So it's a two-edged sword like everything else. Yeah, go ahead. That's it. Yeah. I was also going to mention a number of things that he just said, so thank you. <laughs> <No worries. laughs> and, and, and we have the opportunity to make sure we elect good school board members, yeah. which is really our job yes. as, as citizens. That we elect good people to represent us, but we, whose values we respect and honor. And knowing before you vote, knowing who they are is critically important, and I think you know, this became very clear in Springfield. We had a huge battle in Springfield. Right. Uh, on the as they did in Essex, and they defeated them, and I think that you happened here as well. Springfield. Right. More narrowly than you'd like to. Right. Indeed. Yep. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. 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 Great. Um, <laughs> on, on the action of things that we can actually do, um, number one is support your librarians, whether they are public librarians or school librarians. Yeah. Also public. <laughs> who have been in, in school education systems as librarians and they are under fire from every direction. Yes. So yeah. you need to just let them know that you support them, even just a kind word, that you appreciate what they're doing and that you support them in their decisions to curate their libraries for their students because that's what they went to school for. It's what they know. Um, information literacy is something that they also teach to kids. So it's very important to have a librarian at every school. Um, so anytime you have a chance to vote on budgets, 
that have to do with library programs, especially in schools. Very important to give them as much as they need for resources so that we don't have schools that have to share librarians. Like, that hurts my heart. <laughs> Um, you know, every, every school deserves to have a librarian, something that I would be personally. Um, something I've learned about being in Vermont is that, that that's not the case here. Um, a lot of schools split them. I believe our elementary school librarian is at, like, two, at least two schools, if not three. Um, so how do you get to know all your kids if you're not there all the time, right? We ask a lot of these people. Um, so on an individual basis, just Support your librarians whenever you can. And they didn't ask me to, but I also want to. I want to thank our other uh, hosts of the event, of course, from the Yankee Bookstore, which again you already probably know that because you're all locals. But thank you again. Um, let me just see if others would like to speak before the day. Is anybody who hasn't raised a point uh, wishing to get a word in edgewise as we near the end uh, before I turn back to these folks? Sure, go ahead then. I, I think it is critical with school board elections, for example, to ask the candidates where they stand on these issues. Uh, it, I just, I didn't ask the question in a recent election, and I am sorry that I didn't. Yes. Another thing that is very easy to do, I heard on National Public Radio one day that Maggie Takuda Hall, who wrote a book called Love in the Library, her book was selected by the Scholastic Magazine Company to be published. So then they said, only if you change some words. Mm -hmm. And she pulled it up. She said, no, I'm not changing that. I, I ordered the book that day and gave it to my grandson. You know, find out what they are and help them get a hold of these books, whether it's through the iPhone to the New York Library or wherever. And there are folks who are doing buying banned books and giving them to their schools and giving them out in their community sidewalk libraries and so forth. Um, any last words? Or should I wrap up? Briefly, yes, please. there was a time when the words banned in Boston were plastered on the cover of the book by the publisher because it sold the book. Yep. <laughs> banned right. in Florida should maybe be a so. That's right. well, yeah, I just want to thank you all. Thank you, and if everyone wants to stick around and chat a little bit, happy to, but uh, thanks for taking the time during your market day uh to come visit <laughs>